On behalf of Investec Private Banking and the Private Equity Committee, it's an honour to welcome Gemma Godfrey. So for those of you that were expecting to see the comedian, I'm really sorry. Um, for me personally, I was hoping that she'd warm up the crowd, and instead I'm warming up the crowd for her, so she's screwed, but anyway. Um, so what I'm going to be speaking about um, in the next 15 minutes is why we have access, or greater access than ever, to the secret of success. So Arnold Schwarzenegger walks into a room. He tells Boy George to listen to a quantum physicist for tips to business success. No, that's not the start of a joke. As I said, I'm not a comedian. Um, but something that actually happened to me about three years ago. I shot The Apprentice um, in a role that I shared with billionaire investor Warren Buffett, Jessica Alba, America's richest self-made businesswoman, actually, although I think Kylie Jenner's now taken over from her, and former CEO of Microsoft, Steve Barmer. And Boy George was my favorite contestant. So what the hell was a relatively unknown Brit um, doing there? What the hell did I have in common with these people? Because it certainly wasn't the same bank balance. So one of the secrets to their success, and what got me to where I am today, and what everyone in this room can do, but few of us do do, is we listen. It sounds really simple, but often the simplest things are the hardest to do. And over the next 15 minutes, I'm going to show you how. So the trait that makes some people succeed while others go blindly down a rabbit hole is the ability to listen, to hear what it is that people want, and with this knowledge to deliver it. So I saw that skill when working with Arnold, and I shouldn't have been surprised. He dominated four industries, bodybuilding, Hollywood, property, yes, he made a killing there, and politics as the governor of California. And you don't get there without listening to what contest judges wanted, what cinema audiences wanted, what voters wanted, or in my case, what his boredom advisor wanted. And that's a truly a great business leader. Someone who listens and acts based on what they hear. Because the world is changing, um, and it's something that I feel quite passionate about, that that old way of working, of being locked in an ivory tower, that's what we're in financial services very good at doing, thinking up a great idea and a great product to sell to people, it's not working anymore. Because it's not about selling products, it's about solving problems, and it's about satisfying real needs out there. And it's easier to do, rather than trying to find customers for your products, actually, you're looking at your customers that are already sitting there and trying to solve their needs. Um, and a quote that I really like comes from the founder of Walmart. He said, there is only, well, we all like to think of ourselves as bosses, but really there is only one boss, and that's the customer. He can fire everyone in the company, from the chairman on down, simply by spending his money elsewhere. But there is good news, um, because we have the ability to listen like never before. Digital information is out there, the digital age. It's quantifiable, it's easy to collect, it's quick to analyze, so we can find out all this information before we launch. We don't need to go out and get a brick and mortar shop. We can actually find out this information, likes, traffic, engagement. And I found out the importance of this when I started my firm. Um, so at that time, gamification and automation were the buzzwords. I'm sure, again, in the private equity world, you've heard that time and time again. Companies sitting in front of you saying, well, we, we, we gamify the system, you know, we, we automate. So they made us feel smart. We thought, well, if we implement that in our business, you know, we'll look great. They make logical sense. Everyone loves a game. Let's turn investing into a game. Let's have it fully digital so that they don't have to speak to anyone ever. But it's actually... Again, the secret of success is it's not about us. It's not about doing what we think makes us look smart, but it's about delivering what people actually want. So people found the things we thought were fun and confusing, and a purely digital service made them feel uncomfortable. And that includes people that didn't actually ever want to speak to anybody, but they wanted to know that they could. So what people really wanted to do is they wanted to understand the service, understand what was going on, what was happening to them, and be in control. So people will tell you if your idea works, and that's always lovely. But equally valuable, they'll tell you if your idea doesn't. And that really can be, I mean, that can be quite hard to hear at times. No one likes to hear they're wrong. Um, but I don't know about you, but I am far more comfortable being wrong and building what people actually want than thinking I'm right and helping no one. 
So I've often been surprised by what we've learned. It's countered widely held um, and logical beliefs, but that's the magic. I mean, that's the secret. If you want to have a service that's differentiated, understanding what other people don't understand and being able to um, have a nugget of information that makes your service stand out and differentiated and really delight customers, I mean, that's the holy grail. So how do we know that we haven't been listening? Well, the first instance is the financial crisis. That really shattered people's trust because they were sold products that they did not understand. Then there's Brexit, and that revealed deep dissatisfaction by people that felt that they weren't being heard, they weren't being listened to, and they felt that they were being left behind. And then closer to home, we've been, we haven't really been listening to each other. And this is the, the vulnerable bit of the speech. So um, I've always struggled, and I'll be open here, I've always struggled to build relationships in the workplace. I'm often working with people that are 10 or 20 years older than me. I'm usually the only woman. And so my priority um, in the office was just to be taken seriously. But that also means it's been very hard for me to admit there's something I don't know, and also I'm a bit of a perfectionist, but also to open up about myself personally or ask for help. And therefore, starting my own business was incredibly humbling. Because you can't pretend to be good at everything, even though you try. Because not only do you fail, if you're trying to be the best at marketing, at sales, at operations, and investment, but people like you guys in this room would be very, very quick to point out the flaws in that as an operating business model. So instead, I found that when I would point out what I was really struggling with, people would step up to help, and we actually got a lot more done. And I think that's why the way that business is working nowadays is changing. There's also a funny story about a time I took a risk in opening up, which I've really debated about whether it's appropriate to tell tonight, but um, I did tell it to the Sunday Times, and I feel like we're all amongst friends here, so if I could have like a pity giggle, that'd be great. Um, so I was at a big, um, like a sales pitch, 10 days after giving birth, and three hours into the meeting, I stood up and I said, I have to leave because my boobs are going to explode. <laughs> I was going off to breastfeed, just in case anyone was wondering. Um, anyway, their reply was, thanks, Gemma. You could have just stopped after saying I had to leave, <laughs> which is a really valid point. But it's a good story because ultimately it made me seem more human, and I now have a really great working relationship with that company, and they're a great advocate for our brand. So I've really seen the value in listening to each other. And one of the reasons I'm here tonight is that, as I said, I successfully sold my business within three years of starting it up. And that's no mean feat. And if there's, there's a shout out to anybody here from PwC who helped me do it, thanks guys, that was awesome. Um, but during my sale, during the sale of the business, my people felt nervous. And obviously, again, you've bought businesses before, keeping the team together was critical because that was half the value of the business. At the same time, I was getting divorced, which, you know, there's nothing like making a challenging time, just that extra bit harder. But telling the team that, meant that if I ever looked down, they knew it had nothing to do with the deal. So the sale went through, and we also went through the full integration period with every single member of the team on board and fully motivated, which I think is a true testament of the value of being open in, that, in, in terms of a relationship. And it works both ways, because when members of my team have personal issues, unlike the olden days of pulling sickies, et cetera, They'll tell me what their issue is, we can plan around it, and there's a continuity of business there, which I think is really important. So essentially, it's the difference between being a boss and being a leader. Um, there's a great cartoon out there, um, so Google it um, if you can. And it basically says, a boss is someone that says, go here. A leader is someone that says, let's go here. And what it means is it's about listening and then being listened to. And you earn that right to be listened to because you've listened to them first. So if I'm so passionate about being this new type of leader, um, why did I sell my business? I'm sure you're all asking yourselves if actually you even care, but let's just say you are. Um, so and what has made this, in, in my opinion, a successful acquisition? So here's the business bit. When I started Moolah, um, I realized there were two things to be successful. Build a great service, and obviously you need customers as well. Two, both equally valuable. Now the former, building the great service, that was within my control, 
And it was something that a large corporate I knew would be completely unable to deliver it. Something with a great user experience, something intuitive, something that really customers really wanted, and it really fitted their needs. The latter, customers, really expensive to build from scratch. And again, there are lots of companies out there that have customers sitting there. So we spent three years building the best service possible and delivering what customers want. Our acquirer was the employee benefits business of the FTSE listed insurer JLT. So they look after thousands of employers who are looking to help their millions of employees improve their financial well-being. So a ready-made customer base and a free distribution model if we get technical. The funny thing is, is that the day that that deal completed, on the very day, day that deal completed, JLT was acquired by Marshall McLennan Companies. So that absolutely was not in my game plan. But it's brilliant because they own Mercer and Thompson's and give us access to 10 times the market. So it's certainly been a wild ride. And just as we've successfully integrated the team and technology into JLT, we're now doing it all over again with Mercer. So what have I learned? What tips can I kind of pass on? Well, I think, yes, for the deal to work, it is about collaboration, about listening to one another, and both parties bringing something valuable to the table. So we brought the service, they brought the customers. They brought the customer insights, we brought the ability to translate it into a service people want. But, and this is, because usually that's where the story ends, but what I've found in the last year or so is that even more important than that is there's an art form there, and there's a really delicate balance between leveraging the strength of the big corporate, so the access to resources, the knowledge bank, the experience, and then at the same time protecting the innovation and the ability of the smaller company to deliver. So letting it drive the efficiency and growth of the wider organization rather than it being stifled, and that's a battle I fight every day. But again, it sounds simple, but it's often the simplest things that are hard to do. So what about a couple of tips before I finish off? Well, first of all, I think it helps to have a shared vision. So we are all, so in JLT, Mercer, in Moolah, we are all motivated to improve people's financial well-being, to cut out the jargon, to make money matters, engaging, relatable, help people understand finance, and have the tools and the confidence to be able to do something about it and save for the things in life that really matter to them. Even better is if there's a consolidated business plan that both organizations work on back and forth because yes, it aligns expectations, but also you get to understand each other's ways of working. And I think that's what's really driven the success of this acquisition so far. So, listening really is the secret to success. With the internet, with data analytics, and a realization that we need to work together, it has never been easier. We should listen to our customers. We should listen to our people. We should listen to each other. So Arnold Schwarzenegger met with Warren Buffett, Jessica Alba, Steve Barmer, and me. And what do we all do? We listen. Think what you can achieve by listening more. Thank you very much. Chairman Godfrey, ladies and gentlemen.